too high, huh? No? It's okay? Like that? Okay, good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here. I know some of you are coming from very far away, uh, even further away than I'm coming. I'm coming from Mexico, Mexico City. So you can imagine it's quite a different scale of a city being in Uppsala, uh, which is nice, actually. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation, especially to Heidi and, and Mia for this wonderful opportunity. It's an, an honor and a pleasure, huge pleasure to be here. My first time in, in Sweden, my first time in this region of Europe. Um, I will try to speak in English, although it will be difficult to do that after David. <laughs> it's a very proper English. You hear my <laughs> I will, I will later. So if I'm saying things that are actually not in proper English, you just raise the hand and ask me to say that again. Um, so I like this. <laughs> I have more autonomy now, as you can see. Um, so let me just begin saying um, I work in the Habitat International Coalition, which is a global federation. Uh, composed by around 350 organizations in more than 100 countries. Uh, and the Mexico office is the office for Latin America, it's a regional office, and I've been the coordinator for that office for the past like eight years, between uh, 2003 and 2011. And now I have this more global role to play. So it's nice because I'm traveling outside Latin America, but it's also challenging because I, I have to do this in, in English <laughs> and other languages. But um, so um, just you, you will see, of course, uh, after the, uh, the David presentation, you will see many similarities, but also some differences. And actually, you can play some, some games about the same picture, different picture, you know, things like that. So this is also a very familiar picture of a popular neighborhood, in this case from, from Latin America. This is from Rio in Brazil, but could be almost any big city in the region. And as you can see, there's many similarities with the pictures David was showing from Asia, but also some differences. And, um, the urbanization process in Latin America, as you know, was the, the peak of the urbanization process was between the 50s and, and the 70s. And at that time was basically linked with the industrialization process in many of the countries. Um, and through the years, we are talking now of more than 50, even 60 years, of course people get to, manage to get some very like formal houses in the sense that they're very big enough and built with the proper materials in general. But the problem, as you can see, is the localization. And of course, the, the question is, why is people there? The answer is very simple. It's because they, don't have, they didn't have and they don't have any other option. So the, this, is, this is a problem that continues even today. But when you see, think about the industrialization of the so-called development process. You think about you know, job opportunities and creating new business, et cetera, et cetera, investment. But usually the governments are not thinking about the housing policy and the land policy related to that. And this is, this is the situation today in many, many parts of the world. And we are seeing now in Africa and Asia the urbanization process is coming later, but at even faster pace than in that one in Latin America, and in most, more case, most cases, and there are more uh, difficult circumstances without an industrialization process, without job opportunities for the people, uh, without strong institutions to support that. Uh, so it's even uh, more difficult. And from that perspective, I think as uh, Latin Americans, we have. Uh, kind of a of responsibility to share 
uh, the experiences we have, no, that we have the model, we have any answers to all the questions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but more like in a solidarity and, and a shared kind of uh, knowledge uh, experience. Um, and this is also to, to show and to say that the urbanization process and the consolidation of the popular settlements were parallel with the democratization of those cities and countries. We, are, we need to remember that uh, that period between the 70s and the 90s in many countries in Latin America, there were strong, very strong dictatorships. So we are talking about these people organizing, claiming rights, building the cities, but not only building houses, but building communities and neighborhoods under very, very difficult situations. And people being killed, very, you know, persecuted, etc., etc., being dead, being killed. Um, so basically the claim from the right to the city, although uh, under other terms, was present even there at that time, in the early 60s and 70s. And people were talking about the need of a urban reform the right to be in the city, to access proper land in the city, and to access the resources in the city, and they were talking about the urban reform. At that time, the agrarian reform was in the agenda, so they were picking up those same issues, the land for the people that need the land, to live or to produce. So they were talking about the urban reform. And you also saw that kind of pictures in the Davis presentation. And it's, of course, it's not a coincidence. Uh, this, is, this is not a, um, just a, the future, an image of the future of the city they're willing to make, in this case, in Mexico City. Actually, that's part of the city already. Uh, this is in the west part of the city. It's called Santa Fe. And actually, it's like twice or even three times that big. And of course, that's the same model. That's the model and the discourse about the global class, cities, competitivity, etc., etc., etc. For us, one of the main questions behind that, or when, when seeing that kind of picture, is what, it, what is the role, which is the role of the different actors, and especially which is the role of the state behind that? Usually, when you see that, you see, well, this is private money, right? And it's you know, a lot of people with a lot of money, they're just making nice buildings. Uh, well, I'm not sure they are quite nice. Actually, they, are look, they look all the same. They look very great and uh, very glassy. And they call those very intelligent buildings. And as you might know, we have some doubts about that because 40% of the people, people working, living there is sick all the time because they are, they are closed, they have these systems of you know, recycling air, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the so-called intelligent buildings, they are actually killing the people inside. But uh, basically, it's the, the no city. The no city, there is no social integration, there is no spaces for you know, public spaces. Those are just places for the cars. And it's very difficult to walk in there. You, you will see there is no uh, sidewalks. To work, to walk, and the the only like public spaces they have, there are the huge malls. So you go inside and buy things. Uh, so you can think this is no city, but this is also a no city or the, the negation of the city in many ways. But even worse than that, <laughs> what is the state doing? <laughs> what is the the public money going to? And so David was talking about the South African model. Well, this is, this is the same. This is the Mexican model. But all those models, and now the Brazilian model, and many, many other countries. But actually, that model, as far as we know, was first uh, pilot in, the, in Chile under the dictatorship of Pinochet. And was a very successful uh, policy in the sense that they managed to transfer public money to private sector, basically. Uh, so now in Chile, well, for the past more than 10 years, our colleagues there are talking not about the problem of the people without home, of homeless people, or the sin techo, we say in Spanish, but the problem of the people with a roof, with a shelter, because of the conditions of those houses. 
you can imagine they are not only very small, but they're really far away from the city center for the opportunities, job opportunities. Uh, they're supposed to fulfill the planning uh, requirements, but they're really in bad shape uh, in like wastelands and the, with the infrastructure problems, the, the, the buildings falling apart, not enough schools, not enough uh, health centers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not public transportation. So we are talking about poor people. This actually, this model was defined for the lower middle class. So that we are we are talking about living outside that model more than 60% of the population in the country, and that was the only housing policy, right? So just for that amount of the population. And even those people depending on jobs. So if you put people without any you know, uh, savings and possibility to invest money that far away, basically you're making the people poorer. Because now people are having to pay that loan, but also paying some rent in the city center because that's uh, where the jobs are, right? So, and now you can see the similarities. Sorry, Debbie, about that. You should take your presentation before. I think it's the only one, though, but. So, we need to think also when talking about what kind of houses, what kind of cities are we making, we need to think also about what kind of citizenship we are making and what kind of citizens and what kind of democracy. And for us, all those questions are very linked. So for the people living in, in the popular settlements, and here we'll make a parenthesis. We don't, we don't really want to talk, we don't like to talk about formal and informal and regular and irregular kind of dualities. Uh, we think it's not fair enough. It's not sufficient enough to actually describe the full range and the, and the complexity of the situation. And it's not describing the different responsibilities of the different actors. And as Heidi mentioned before, at the beginning, it's actually uh, the informality is being produced by the formal actors at the formal sector uh, because it's convenient in many, many ways. So it's functional to that system. So we prefer to talk more from a more uh, autonomous and positive point of view uh, about the, the popular settlements or the social production of habitat. But for people living in, in those settlements, it's very clear that all the issues are connected and all the rights are connected. It's very clear. We don't need to put it in a very abstract way that the interdependency of the rights, etc., etc., of the complex uh, integral approach to reality, of the territorial approach, etc., etc. For the people, it's very clear because it's think of it's a matter of everyday life. So that slogan is just perfect to, to make the synthesis of that. No land, no house, no vote. And why are the mapping and the popular mapping initiative so important? Because basically it's to say, we are here. We are here. We are, we are, we are something. We are people. We are citizens. We have some rights. It's not a coincidence that for many, many years, even in Mexico City, many popular settlements been there for 20 years, 30 years, you won't find them in the official maps, right? So no name for the neighborhoods, no name for the roads, so basically no address. And you just think for a minute, how many, in how many occasions you need to provide an address to access to some services or even some rights? Right? So this is very linked, it's all very linked. And the pe for the people it's very clear that they need to fight for all those things all together. For, from a more classical uh, human rights approach, usually you think about rights and you think about groups and uh, population groups or sectors. And, but the problem is when you come to a city or from a city local authority perspective is how you deal with that, how you manage all those different interests and, and needs and rights. 
So that's why we need to move forward and to go forward. And that's why we are talking about the right to the city as a different approach to the so-called liberal rights. And we know that rights are not just concessions from the state or from God or from outside the planet, but there are struggles. They're, they came out of struggles and many, many, many deaths. Uh, or centuries, even more than centuries. So you might remember that the, the, the first uh, modern paper declaration to talk about human rights, it's a, the French declaration of the right to uh, men rights and the, and the citizens right, rights. And basically they talk about liberty, property, security, but also resistance to oppression. And I think this is very important because usually we, we forget about that. Uh, so from the very beginning, the, the, the right to resist to oppression was there, all together with the property and the liberty with a more, and the security, which are now part of the uh, official speech about the human rights. But also it's interesting to notice that uh, the property rights was linked from there to the public interest. So you don't have the right to do whatever you want with your property, but there is a public collective interest, and so your property will have some limits. But if you are thinking from this historic approach of rights, we also know that we are changing that, and we, we are, we are having, we're facing new needs of new rights. So if we are thinking about the urban era we are now, more, most, more of the half of the population living in, in urban spaces. Well, perhaps we need to think about urban rights too. So we need to think about public transportation, tele telecommunications, energy, also land. And land is, of course, not a very new right. It's a very old one. But it's not a coincidence that it's not a single recognition of the right to land in the international uh, instruments, all, only for indigenous, pe indigenous people. And of course, it's not a coincidence because of the very uh, market-oriented kind of approach to, to land. <coughs> and of course, the right to the city. For us, the right to the city is part of that more like historic process of struggles trying to fulfill new needs and uh, new proposals. Just think about it. Uh, as women, as uh, African American people, indigenous people, etc., uh, the process of getting the rights at the beginning, when they are talking about the, the right, the men's rights and the rights of citizens, there were only white men, right? Then when all men, and then women, and then other groups. So we are talking; it's not just uh, the rights are not for everyone uh, at, at once, but this is a process of. And it's actually a very recent process in, in human history. So that for us is one of the main, the, the, one of the six components of the right to the city. And it's what we call the full citizenship of the full exercise of human rights in a territory. It's not just the recognition of the rights of the national state signing uh, international declarations, but it's how to implement that from a, local, from a local perspective, from a city perspective. And for that, local authorities need to uh, check, make the checklist between the, the policies and the human rights. Most of the states have signed those uh, international declarations that are international law. So they should do that. Not only have a human rights program, but to have a human rights approach for all the public policy in the city. Changing color because changing also the component. This is the second component of the right to the city. And this is linked to try to denounce and stop speculation. We all know that under the neoliberal era, the state was withdrawing responsibility to urban planning and control of land market, basically. And also housing producing, etc. So basically the market is doing that. So how much is like uh, 12 million pounds in, in, in crowns? You know that? Multiply by 10. Okay, 
So you can, you can have the price of that <laughs> flat in London. I sh I'm sure pre many of you can afford that, right? <laughs> well, there is some people that, uh, I don't know, perhaps she's a singer or something like that. And some people from outside the planet would, are really interested in buying <laughs> flats in uh, London. So this is just crazy, right? We are, we are, and we are facing that not only in London and in big cities and big capitals in the north. We are facing that all over. And especially for the past 10, 15 years, the prices were going like just crazy. I'm, I'm sure you know that and you have that, those numbers. Well, the job possibilities are going like that and the income of the people is going like that too. If not the income, the value of the income. So we are, we are facing this kind of graphic, and you all know that. But also, the kind of solution the state is uh, uh, promoting, and this is the case in Spain, but it's the case in many other countries, especially in the north, basically trying to confuse housing rights with property rights. And for us, housing rights are much more than just property and much more than just individual property. So under the discourse of you know, building a, a country of owners, there was the discourse under Thatcher, Reagan, and many, many, many presidents all over the world for the past 30 years. Uh, basically, we are creating crisis. And you all know that the, the, the last big economic financial crisis was linked to the, the housing sector. So now you have the, the numbers over there say, six million empty houses in Spain, while there are 500 evictions per day. And they don't have the official numbers of the suicides, but we know that around hundreds now. And not only that, but those people, organized people at national level, they are proposing uh, like a law, like a citizen's initiative law, uh, try to deal with the, with the problem and bring some solutions. And the party in the power is saying no. So not, not just not facing the problem, but not even facing or open the possibility to solutions that the people, the affected people is bringing to the table. Also the lack of social housing and social rental housing. I'm not sure about the situation in the north and not aware at all about the situation in Sweden, but in our countries in the south, the state that just withdraw building houses, but also to promote new houses for, for rent. And there is no rent control, no rent, uh, no state intervention in the rent market. While the rent is an option for at least 30% of the population in big cities. But also, the, I'm sure David and, and Diana recognize that picture because that, that one is coming from London. Uh, but also the privatization of the social housing. So not only not new buildings and not social uh, housing for rent built, but they are also destroying the, the, the rental houses already existing. Uh, from a more like from a south perspective, it's also the need of recognition and regularization of the settlements that people already made. No? And as David mentioned before, there is no official statistics about that, but we know that in the global, global south, between the 30 and in some cases up to the 90% of the cities have been made by the people, not the state, not the market. And actually, if you need to put together the money from the state and the market, you won't build all the houses the people need. But this is not recognized as an asset and a possibility and the capacity of the people to do things, but it's more frame as a problem. So basically the struggle here is for recognition and the recognition is of course also to access to services and access to public money. And I think we are here dealing with of course the autonomy and the space of the autonomy and the self-manage and we want to keep that and we all know it's important for the organizations to keep that. But also we have the right to access to public money. And we have the right to have the, some state presence in our communities for the things we need the state. There are other things we don't need the state. And it's better to keep them away. Uh, so also the recognition 
and the regularization, both in the sense of access to infrastructure and services and community facilities, etc., but also the security of tenure issue. Because this is very tricky. And the high T situation is perhaps one of the most horrible and the more clear example of that uh, crazy situation. You have a the huge disaster and you have all the money and many institutions to do things there and they they have in this parenthesis kind of situation because they don't the official money coming from outside both the multilateral agency money and also the private donors money they won't invest any cent until they have some legal certainty on the land and of course there is no legal legal certainty so they won't do anything basically so we are like trapped in those kind of situations. They are not just stupid, but criminal. But also when you talk about housing, the first question, especially coming from journalists, is how, how much, how big is the deficit? And we don't, we don't like to start talking about housing problems from a deficit point of view. We rather prefer to talk about other issues like regularization of the already existed settlements, etc. But also about the empty houses and the ep empty buildings we have. And not only for housing, but also for community services and, and s cinemas and, uh, you know, cultural spaces, etc., etc. Being just abandoned in our cities. And we don't have like an official um, catastrophe. Was that catastrophe in English? We don't have like official catastrophe of the empty buildings in our cities. So at the core of the right to the city of struggle is to know how many empty spaces we have and how many properties are not fulfilling the social function. And we have the right to claim that. And in many cities in the south, the, the amount is huge. It's not just few houses. We are talking about uh, a very important uh, proportion. But also we have this uh, gentrification, beautification kind of processes all over the south and the north. And being the special occasions that big event, sport, cultural sports, etc., a perfect excuse basically to displace people and to evict people. And, but also to make huge public investment. So we go to the government usually to ask for services for the popular neighborhoods and houses, etc. They say, no, we don't have any money. We don't have any money. We don't have any money. And all of a sudden, you see those huge new stadiums and facilities. So there is some money out there, right? And usually the answer is, no, no, that's private money. Well, this is not the case, actually. And some friends of our um, coalition, they did this uh, research and uh, actually very strong campaign in India against the Commonwealth uh, Games there, the Olympic Games, showing how much of the public, uh, the, the public money was in those um, investments, actually it was the majority of the money, um, but also quantifying the losses. When you, when you hear about those initiatives, they usually talk about development and the building new things. But they, ne they never talk about the things they are going to destroy. And they never talk about the, the losses of the people, and especially for the poor people. So you have some numbers over there. Uh, now the situation uh, for the past two years at least, and for the next three or four years, it is, is uh, very critical in Brazil, in many parts of this Brazil. And our colleagues here from Brazil can uh, <coughs> certainly talk, uh, talk more about that, but the, the evictions going on and the real estate speculation going on in many, many cities, in 12 cities in, in Brazil, because of the World Cup, Soccer World Cup next year and two years later the Olympic Games. So that's, that's a social function of, of the property, the land and the city, which is one of the main components of the right to the city, and it's at the heart of the struggle for the right to the city and to access and enjoy the city. The other one is linked with the democracy, but again, not just the liberal understanding of democracy, the representative democracy and the electoral kind of democracy. Thank you. 
but the, the real one, the, the democracy at the local level, at the neighborhood level, and the decision-making level. We, we are kind of uh, tired of participating in consultations, right? So consultation here and there, here and there. But then the decision-making process is taking place in another part of the building. So we are talking about decision-making processes and the right of civil society and the people to participate in that through different kind of uh, instruments. The other one, and David already talked about that, is what we call the social production of habitat. And we have many examples all over. And usually those initiatives are more like individual family base. But we are saying that it's not only a few neighborhoods, we are talking about entire cities. This is uh, La Paz, El Alto in Bolivia, and half of the city have been built by the people. I mean, and El Alto is all uh, made by the people. So we are talking about the huge capacity, actually, to build things and to do things. And when you look at that and you understand that and you kind of support that and in an organized way, you can have very nice results, like the cooperatives in Uruguay, thousands of units in Uruguay. Now the same model being uh, applied in many other countries in the region. So, but we are talking about a system being in place to support that. So land access, and money access and technical assistance, etc., etc. But also the relevance of having not only a place to live, but a, a place to produce and to produce an income. So relevant for people, and especially the poor people, with that, no access to formal jobs, especially these days. Uh, but usually the housing policy is one thing and the economic policy is another thing, right? And we need to link that. And actually, the people is linking that. And not only to provide services, but actually production of things and production of food, which is a huge issue in our cities, especially at big scale cities like Mexico. Well, just think about, in, even in, in Uppsala, I'm not sure, but just analyze where is the food coming from and where is the water is coming from and where the, go the water going after we use, et cetera, et cetera. We need to think in our cities about our cities in a more circular way and a circular metabolism. And of course, create opportunities of income. If you don't have a proper space, of course, you use the public space to do that, especially women. So that's what we call the democratic production and, and the right to a productive habitat. The fifth one is related to the sustainability and what we call the responsible management of the common goods. So natural resources, energetic resources, but also heritage and uh, cultural and uh, traditional uh, traditions resources. And another parenthesis in here. Uh, I know we are more or less familiar with the urban issues. We, we cannot talk about the urban issues without talking about the countryside, without talking about the rural areas. And I think we are, we are just being functional to that dichotomy. And this is leading us not to understand really the, the problems and not to find the proper solutions to, that, to the problems. So basically, we are talking about, in our countries for the past 30 years, no support, any, almost any support to kind of uh, a small scale family scale production in the countryside. So of course people needed to migrate all over. Also the imposition, not only in the south, but also in the north, this is near Paris, uh, imposition of huge useless projects. Uh, they are trying to build a new airport outside Paris in uh, Notre Dame de Landes, and people is opposing that because this are agricultural land and they actually the city don't need, and the country don't need, and the region don't need another airport. So they are opposing that, but of course they are facing huge repression and, um, from, from the police. Um, this is in Mexico City, but it's also an opposition to a new highway. It's already built there. Uh, 
but destroying also green areas and privileging them and making a privilege again for the car and not for the public transportation kind of uh, system. Uh, the pressure over the green areas, this is also in Mexico, but we, you can see that all over. The urbanization process put in a huge uh, pressure on the green areas and the conservation of the green areas, but also, again, linked with the lack of a housing policy and lack of a land access policy for the poor people. So basically, there are invasions going on in that area. So you need a policy to maintain the environment, maintain the production of the environment, uh, but also link with the housing and land policy. Otherwise, you are facing the conflict between those two. We all know about the waste problems and the waste management uh, in our cities, but basically because we are conceiving the waste as waste. So we will have some presentations here, uh, here about that, so I won't go Further on that, the energy consumption basically in the cities is not difficult to tell, but the energy consumption is uh, higher. Uh, and, and we need to take care of that, and we need to be really aware, even when talking about the right to the city and the rights in the city, also about the rights of the planet and the rights of the Mother Earth to survive and uh, to be there for the next generations. And also the pressure, the pressure on the over the, the cultural patrimony. <coughs> and finally, the the sixth component for us is the public space, related with the public space in the cities, and the public spaces in our countries being under attack also, and the privatization attack, or just. Uh, uh, the state that don't taking care of the public spaces. Uh, I'm not sure if the property, private property sign is for the cars, for the parking lots, or for the snow, but in any case, uh, we are facing those signs all over, and also f facing the struggles for maintaining and creating new public spaces. The, the one is in Toronto, this is uh, downtown Toronto. You can imagine the, the price of the square meter there, and they're building those high rises, very, very expensive one. And basically the people is organizing to claim a public space and a public park over there. And this conception of the private uh, public spaces being now reduced in many of our countries to the malls and just places to go and consume and places to go with the cars, etc. So you all know that. But this is the still, although it's 50 or 60 years uh, old, in our countries in the South, it's still presented like a very, very modern kind of style of life. So people claim in the streets, of course, uh, for other purposes, uh, more related with the life and uh, other kind of other ways to enjoy the public space, not only through cars and by cars. Uh, the struggle for the public space to generate income, and we will hear also in this conference uh, presentations about that. We can see that all over the world, and the also the cultural manifestations and the street art part of the right to the city and not being criminalized like uh, graffitis and you know young people doing crazy things and uh, ruin our, our walls etc cetera, etc cetera, right uh, this is in valparaiso it's a beautiful one no? in chile but also the political contents of the public space we all know that the public space is not only to enjoy and to have some recreation and, and cultural and, and, and sport sportive activities but also for political for political uh, purposes. Uh, that's the Plaza Tahir in Egypt. And also, we all know the, the relevance of the public spaces for the democratization process and to build actually a real democracy. So I, I can go later on this, but uh, also Juan Jose will present more about the right to the city, but this is just finishing to say, saying that those components, those six main components of the right to the city are now included in the Mexico City Charter, uh, which is kind of original in that sense. 
Uh, you can find other instruments about human rights in the city or the right to the city with the first uh, top three components, but we are adding the other three. And it's a very unique document in that sense. And we are now facing the struggle to try to implement the charter and not just to be a, a document, another document, uh, like many others we have around the right to the city. So thank you very much. <laughs>